Okay, so in today's video, we're going to talk about getting started in instrument repair. Uh, we're going to go over doing it yourself, for yourself, and then getting started is like a hobby business. I'm not going to try to talk on doing it as a full-time, you know, this is your day job business because that's not what I do. I do it as a hobby business. I really enjoy doing them, so I figured I'd share how I got started with them and share some of the tools you need. First, let's cover how I got started with them. So the very first one I did was for 2001 uh, GMC Sierra, which is what I drive. Um, did it quite five or six years ago, maybe. Eh, probably, probably closer to five years ago. And um, all is what was wrong with it is it just had the dead odometer. And I fixed it, and it really wasn't that hard, and I realized that there was a demand for it. So when I looked into it, I found out this was a common problem. There's a lot of these that have this problem. Then I got a 2004 Tahoe later after that, and the uh, all the gauges were dead on it, and the park reverse neutral screen was dead on it. So I fixed it, and it was pretty easy also i was having a little bit difficulty uh learning how to do some of the desoldering on there but other than that it, it was pretty easy to do so it's like hey, these, there's a lot of these out there doing this doing research and there's a lot of instrument clusters that need repair so i spent another year just kind of learning electronics learning how to solder better because before i did my own instrument cluster the most soldering i'd done was putting two wires together. I'd done a V8 swap on an S10 and fuel injected it, so I had to build a whole harness for it there. So I learned a little bit about it, the electronic side of cars there too. So that's really, that's where I got started in the electronics on these cars, which is why I primarily just work on GM stuff, is just because it's what I know, and it's what I enjoy. I, I know how to read the wiring diagrams from GM stuff, they always look the same. It's it's easy to find the pinouts and everything. So that's that's why I'm mostly doing GM and that's that's where I got started with them is with GM instrument clusters and GM ECUs. Um, so now let's go into some of these tools that you're gonna need. Okay, so if you're uh, doing your instrument cluster yourself, uh, there's really only two things, you, or well, three things you're going to need. Uh, if you do it just for yourself and it's just going to be a one-time thing, you have no interest in really doing electronics anymore, uh, all what you need to do is get one of those kits that they sell on Amazon that comes with the stepper motors and the bulbs. The bulbs are generally junk that are in there, and it has the soldering iron and the desoldering pump in it. Just grab one of those. That's really all what you're going to need to, to do it yourself. Those kits come with lead-free solder, so I would suggest buying yourself some uh, leaded solder because it's a lot easier to work with, and I'd suggest buying some Flux. Uh, again, if it's just a one-time thing, though, I wouldn't go for these name brand stuff. Just go for some cheap Chinese uh, leaded solder and some cheap Flux if, uh, if that's what you're... Uh, if you're just doing, you know single instrument cluster for yourself so that's what you need another thing you may need if you're dealing with like odometer air or something you're gonna need something that you can program it with uh this mini pro is an amazing programmer and if you are gonna continue on i'd highly suggest getting a mini pro but there are little five dollar um programmers you can get away with uh if if you're just gonna do just the one instrument cluster and never do it again but uh, I mean that that really covers us what you need uh, for doing one uh, for yourself because you don't need you don't need to get any of the harnesses you don't need to be getting a power supply or any of that kind of stuff if you're just fixing your own instrument cluster for your truck because you got your truck out there you just go plug it in to test it if you're doing LEDs to flip around the polarity on them stuff like that you really just don't need to go crazy that really crappy soldering iron that comes in the kit will do the job for uh, your single repair that you're just doing for yourself so that really wraps up what you need if you're uh, doing your own repair and it's just a one-time deal you're never going to be working on electronics again um, I mean, you can always spring and get a couple extra things if you think you're going to do more electronics but if it's just a one-time thing just get one of those kits okay so now if you're considering doing this as like a hobby business there's uh, more stuff that you're going to need than uh, doing it as a one-time deal. So again, you know, you're going to need the same stuff we already showed from, from the uh, 
a single use thing but now you're going to need to start getting into things i'm not going to go into all the small little hand tools uh, but let me just cover a couple of them real quick. So one thing is every time you run to the junkyard You're gonna want to go cut some of these out of the trucks and stuff because uh, I promise you you're gonna you're gonna wear them out these these things wear out and you gotta replace them over and over again on your bench So the uh, other kind of hand tool stuff you don't want to get something for pulling the um, Needles off so that way you're not wearing your fingers out all day a lot of times in the videos I just pull them off of my hands, but I, I have the pry tool. I have this yellow one and I have a metal one um, And when you're doing two or three uh, a day You're gonna want this because your fingers really start get wore out from popping the lens open and pulling the needles off uh, You're gonna want to get yourself plenty of, of um, Tweezers I like to get the cheaper ones because I have a really bad habit of scraping with my tweezers um, you really shouldn't scrape with your tweezers. Just get a X-Acto knife and use it for scraping. You you will be doing scraping when you run uh, jumpers and stuff. So uh, don't don't think you're never gonna have to scrape on a board. Um, but yeah, I just get pretty cheap tweezers so that way I don't feel bad if I bend them and throw them away. Um, keep my flux in here, and then I got a variety of different tips, and you're definitely going to want a variety of different tips, because different tips work good for different things. Uh, these uh, wedge tips work really good for desoldering, same with the knife tips, I find them to work really good for desoldering, and just for general purpose use, uh, these J tips are really good. I almost, I, I think I've never used this conical tip. I don't, I just don't like playing conical tips. They're about useless. But that one came in a set, so I have it. Um, so that really covers the little hand tools that you're going to need. There's, there's obviously other stuff. Um, these uh, Chemtech wipes are great wipes for when you're working on a board or something. Uh, you need to wipe off your flux. You know, you take a little isopropyl alcohol and some Kim wipes and you can wipe it right off of there and it doesn't leave a bunch of lint on there like a paper towel or a rag might so definitely uh, Kim wipes for your friend on your bench their staple must have that really covers the hand tool portion of it let's get into some of the more interesting tools so I have this JBC it's a very expensive soldering station with really expensive tips so if you're thinking about doing this as a hobby business I wouldn't recommend this because <laughs> it's expensive to maintain this uh, soldering station uh, I do prefer it over my um, KSGER uh, soldering station over here um, but I, I do like the fact that this one is a whole lot cheaper to get tips for. The tips are about $10, while these tips are at least $40. Um, and this this station's like $60 bucks, uh, from China, or $80 bucks if you buy it on Amazon. While this one, if you buy it new, it's around $400. Um, but you can pick them up used for a lot less than that and that's why i have this one is i got a really good deal on this one used but i would not recommend jumping on one of these really high-end soldering stations like a jbc uh you could i would i would recommend if you're gonna go for like a full-on uh name brand station probably the one of the hacko um fm series uh, i would not recommend the 888 delta on a workbench because it has no sleep function and uh, it doesn't have an it, the um, it's not an integrated tip. So these the uh, heat heating elements integrated in here. Same with same with this guy. Uh, so they heat up a little bit faster, uh, a little more accurate, and uh, they they go to you know, they just heat up and cool down better. So uh, I, I definitely would not recommend a soldering station that does not have an integrated tip. On the next thing you're gonna wanna, really want to have is a um, electronic desoldering state gun um, these, these are really nice because it, it saves you from sitting there with a pump and an iron all day going back and forth uh, I know I know some guys don't like these uh, if, if you've ever seen bear vids he fix amplifiers he does it all with one of these he, he never uses a uh, desoldering gun uh, I, I don't know how he does it I'd, I'd go insane with the solder pump all day long but uh, 
Yeah, I, I use an Amnesty ZD915 uh, for, for my uh, desoldering station. I've had it for a little over a year and uh, very satisfied with it. I think, I think I've actually had it for two years now. Um, the pump occasionally gets clogged on it with the flux if i'm if i'm using flux while i'm desoldering it'll clog up the pump i try to avoid using it um but about once every six months or once a year uh, i've only had to clean the pump twice in it um just run some rubbing alcohol through the pump and it clears it out so uh it's it's not perfect it's definitely not nearly as good as this hack is but this amnesty is only a hundred bucks while the the hacko units uh run a little over 400 if uh last time i checked so maybe the i think the held handheld ones are a little cheaper but if you get like one of these stations from hacko they're really expensive uh you're gonna need a dc power supply i have the cheapest uh adjustable dc uh linear dc power supply they sell on uh on ebay uh but uh the Switching power supplies and linear power supplies will both work for instrument clusters. You don't need uh, super accurate power for the instrument clusters to work. You're definitely, again, going to need one of these programmers uh, to fix odometer air and to reprogram mileage if you choose to go that route. They do make handheld units that you can use to, to program them and program them through the OBD2 port. So if you're doing a lot of uh, odometer correction, I'd recommend going that route. I don't do a ton of odometer correction, even though I do a bunch of videos on it. I actually really don't like doing odometer correction because a lot of guys are a little shady with showing proof, and I just don't trust them. Um, doesn't mean you're liable. There's, you can actually sign off waivers, and you would probably never be liable as the uh, business doing it, but... I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. Seek legal advice from a real attorney on that one. But that's why I choose to uh, not do a lot of them. If if they can't show me that they like their old cluster, if they don't have both clusters still, I, I don't do them. Because they, they, it doesn't matter how broken their cluster is. I can pull that EEPROM off there and get the data off of it. Again, uh, you're going to need some sort of helping hand uh, occasionally. Uh, I like these Omnivices. Huge fan of the Omnivice. But uh, some people like the little the little hand, helping hands so that uh, grab on them. I like the Omnivice because it keeps things nice and flat. If you start to get into things other than amplifiers, I mean other than instrument clusters, probably like amplifiers, one of these um, parts testers are great to have. Uh, you can test um, capacitors. So that way you can get the capacitance value of different capacitors, which is useful for the instrument clusters. Um, you check diodes on here. Uh, but, but the main thing that you would use this for is checking like MOSFETs and stuff like that. Uh, so very useful device here. All right, so then you're going to need a hot air station. I have one of these um, oh, 858s, I believe. Um, I can't find this one for sale anywhere anymore. I really like it because you can program the channel on it, and uh, it, it goes to sleep as soon as it goes in there. has a nice... So, see, some of them have, like, buttons for the... Uh, tem uh, not temperature. Air control and temperature. I don't I, I don't like that. I like having this knob to control the, uh, the fan speed and then doing that. And then it'll always power up into the last... Um, uh, temperature you set with this one so like last time you set it and then you still have your three channels so i like having those three channels that you can program because i can do a low temperature if i'm just trying to get stuff off the board like underfill or something and then i can have a uh, higher temperature for actually taking the uh do, doing the solder work so uh i don't think i have channel three even programmed anything uh you'll need a good multimeter for random diagnostics uh i have a BK Precision benchtop multimeter, but you really don't need anything that fancy. You really need to have some sort of fume extractor because uh, flux, it causes respiratory problems if you, if you just don't do anything. So I, I started out with just using a fan to kind of blow it away, but as I started to get into some of these um, more, uh, the, the better fluxes and stuff like that they just have really harsh fumes and when you get them you're just like oh god um so i finally sprung and got the the hacko um fume extractor and 
uh, you, when I remember to use it, I, I never smell any, uh, any flux. Uh, and then I almost forgot one of your most important tools is going to be a microscope. Uh, I have an AM scope. And uh, if if you really get in there and you're starting to run a lot of jumpers and stuff like that, the uh, microscope really just saves the day. It makes it makes a lot of that work easier. It makes finding cracked solder joints a lot easier too when you're tra trying to figure out, you're finding some intermittent problem and you're just chasing your tail on that. So an AM scope microscope is definitely going to save the day if you ever get one. Uh, there's uh, another brand out there, Ekins or Ekins. Uh, it's supposed to be just as good as an AM scope. I can't speak on it because I don't own one. Um, but if I were to sell my AM scope, I'll probably grab an Ekins or Ekins, whatever it's called. Because I have an older AM scope that has the, um, it's got a little plunger when you want to use a trinocular. So it closes one of the eye ports and turns on the trinocular. It's, uh, I got a really good deal on it. I mean, the um, the type of mount that my AM scope's in, it costs more than the, um, the than I paid for the the whole setup, uh, and and that was all included. So I can't complain about the deal I got on that. Uh, but if I were to do it all over again, I would not get one of these um, uh, with with the uh, plunger. Make sure make sure if you, if you're gonna go for a trinocular, uh, get one that doesn't have the plunger. Getting a microscope, though, you don't need a trinocular unless you're planning on doing videos or just having it up on the screen for your customers to to watch what you're doing. Um, you, you don't need the trinocular, and you're, you're looking at a significant price difference in the two. It may not look like a significant price difference in the two, but once you start accounting for putting that high-end uh, camera on there, which you're going to want, I have a really cheap camera, and it's a pain in my ass uh so, um yeah you're gonna end up you're gonna end up wanting the high-end cameras which is another three hundred dollars it's almost what you paid for the whole microscope so uh that that really wraps up this video of what you need tools wise and everything the the other thing that you're just non-tool related you're gonna need to build uh, some marketing skills to of you know find your niche marketing of how you want to do it if it's radio if it's um, you know word of mouth you know wh whatever you're trying to do you take take that sector of marketing and just try to dominate it um, I think the best way to uh, dominate marketing this kind of business if you're doing it at home is to just try to do the right thing no matter what um, always just be that be that trustworthy person because they're already not going to trust you that much since you're doing it at home since you don't have a storefront they're already skeptical so you just ha you can't you can't be beating around the bush on anything you got to shoot them straight on everything like hey this is this is what's going on this is what i can do this is what i can't do um and if i can't do it this other person can if they can and if they if nobody else can do it just be honest this this is not something anybody does um so you got got to build those kind of business skills that that's the hardest thing learning how to work on these instrument clusters is easy learning how to deal with customers is uh, a whole nother story at least for me i don't know i don't have patience for bs i i, I really don't and, um you'll you'll run into that you, you'll run into people just just saying whatever they want to say and god it, it, <laughs> that's the hard part of doing this the marketing and dealing with the you know the, the people that you just can't make happy especially when you're goal is to do whatever whatever you can to make things right so uh, hopefully I haven't rambled on too long on this video I just wanted to cover these basic things that you just really need to have to to get started on this um, you know there's tons and tons of other little tools I have in here but I'm not gonna drag it all out there's the that's the basics that's what you need to get started I'd also recommend uh, some sort of mat like this because they're a whole lot easier to clean than trying to clean your uh, wooden worktop that you've been tearing up so yeah I hope you guys like this video and I'll uh, see you in the next one